Uh, this could be perhaps a repeat of 1929 or perhaps worse. Certainly, you've heard these projections before. How would you respond to well, these remarks? I think there are a lot of the people, a lot of comments and considerations about a recession that don't necessarily uh, find support in, in existing data and such. The debt is a problem. It has been a problem for 40 years, but it uh, it's not as big of a problem as some of the fear-mongering and the fearfulness uh, would have us believe. We're here with Jeff Christian, managing partner of the CPM Group, and we'll be discussing his outlook for the economy, a recession perhaps, and gold and inflation and everything that comes in between. Jeff, it's good to see you again. Welcome to the David Lynn Report. Good to be with you and congratulations on your new show. I understand it's doing well. Uh, I've watched a few episodes. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I had a I had the pleasure of reading your gold year book, which came out recently, and you have a silver year book coming out in May, which we can uh, tease for the audience later in the interview. But first, I want to touch on some key points that you brought up in your last gold year book. Now, the CPM group has been calling for a recession anytime between 2024 and 2026. And we've had this discussion last year, you and I. Now it's 2023, and just last week, the Federal Reserve uh, meeting minutes revealed that the Fed believes we are headed for a mild recession later in the year. Uh, with regards to timing, uh, there's a bit of a discrepancy with what the CPM group believes and what the Fed is projecting. Can you help us explain your rationale and why you think the Fed may be a little bit premature sure. in this projection? Well, well, yeah. Well, I think what the Fed actually said was they think that a recession, that we're headed toward a mild recession, and it's possible that it'll be in the second half of this year. Um, you can predict that there will be future recessions with 100% certainty, but mm -hmm. calling the timing, the depth, and the duration of recessions is extremely a matter of art as opposed to science. It doesn't lend itself to econometrics. You know, I'll just give you two data points. In 1978, I thought there'd be a recession in 1979. I was wrong. It was 1980 through 1982. In 2007, I thought that there would be a recession in 2009. I was wrong. We were already in a recession by the end of 2007. You know, and, and when I criticized myself uh, in front of one of our clients, you know, about the fact that we thought it would be 2009 and 2000, inst and it was 2008 instead, you know, they said, that's okay. You know, we made the same mistake. It's really hard to call the timing. And with all due respect, you know, you've had any number of people, many of whom you interview, who have been calling for a recession every year for the last five years, 10 years, 20 years. So it, it, it's, it's hard to call the timing depth and duration of a recession. And what we've been saying is that we thought a recession could emerge as early as the first fourth quarter of this year, but more likely it would be in 2024. And we say that because of the strength that we see in various parts of the economy uh, uh, globally and within the United States. But you know, a recession can start at any time. And what is clear is that there are conditions that are building up both in the US and in Japan and in Europe uh, that suggest that we are headed toward a recession of some volume within the next 24 months. Okay, Jeff, let's talk about investment themes. Now, all throughout 2021 and for the first half of 2022, inflation was the dominant investment theme. Everyone was talking about how to hedge against 40-year high inflation in the U.S. and how to protect your wealth from being eroded. Uh, inflation has since come down on paper. The CPI print has been coming down since last June, where, where it peaked at 9.1%. But of course, people are still talking about inflation. But what is a dominant theme of 2023? I, you know, we, at the beginning of this year, we said 2023 is going to be a year of transition. It's a transition in all kinds of things. Uh, definitely economic trends, inflation, you know, the transitory inflation that ran from March of 2021 into July of 22 
has been coming down, as you said. You know, so all those people who say, oh, yeah, the Fed was stupid to say that it was transitory. Well, it was 15 months of rising inflation rates. And now we've had about eight months of declining inflation rates. So inflation, we're in a period of transition. Inflation is coming down, but it's still high. Interest rates are rising uh, in the United States. They'll probably have, well, you know, we think you'll see one more increase in the Fed funds rate um, in early May, and then it probably stays high. Uh, financial markets are in transition because a lot of mid-tier banks and smaller banks uh, didn't have the risk uh, management and CFO oversight. And a lot of them, like silver, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was a state chartered bank. It was overseen by the state government. And state chartered banks and state supervision of state chartered banks has always been a weak spot in the US financial system. Throughout the 19th century, before we had a central bank in, in a federal central bank, you know, uh, we, we relied on state banks. And the state supervision was always a problem, which is why we had bank runs every couple of years and depressions every decade uh, back in the 1870s, 80s, 90s into 1907, 1913. So we're in a period of transition. Stock market, bond market, interest rates, inflation, fiscal policy, the state of the economy. As I said earlier, we've seen very strong consumer demand and business demand for both goods and services, very strong demand for employment. You're starting to see all three of those things cool. So we're in this period of transition and that transition leads to a lot of uncertainty and mixed messages and that creates market volatility. And then you, you know, so you have the market miss, the market saying, we know what the Fed is doing we know what the Fed is saying it's going to do, but we're refusing to believe that the Fed is doing what it's doing and saying what it's doing, or going, you know, going to do what it says it's going to do. And therefore, we have this other view of interest rates. And when we're proven wrong, we're going to have to adjust for it. You know, I mean, the one joke that I heard this morning, which was pretty good, was that Tucker Carlson was on uh, Fox News last night saying that Fox hadn't settled. You know, it's just like, no, it has, you know, and the Fed has made it very clear what it's doing. It has been more transparent than any Fed prior to this one in history. And the market has been misreading it, misinterpreting it and refusing to listen. And when that catches up with the market, you're going to see some very interesting transitions in stock values, bond values, corporate bond values, uh, currency rates. And gold and silver. Right. So the, the best and perhaps worst performing assets in this period of transition, what would they be? I would think that uh, mid-tier bank stocks will be the worst performing asset. Uh, some other corporations, you know, and I think that gold and silver will probably be among the best. I mean, if you look at last year on our quilt chart that we do, silver and gold were the top two performing, well, cash. Treasury bills was the top performing asset last year out of 11 things that we look at. And gold and silver were the next uh, best at 3.3% increase in silver and 0.016% decline in gold. The next one down was negative 11%. You know, if you look at the first quarter, gold was the best performer and silver was third or fourth place. We think that gold and silver will be among the best performing assets in 2023 and in 2024. Certainly, I've been talking to a lot of people who are very bearish on the economy. Um, I'd like you to maybe address some of the more bearish outlooks that I've heard, at least with me. Um, and there's a lot of them out there on the internet. Um, you know, Jeff, the severity and the duration of a recession or an economic downturn are difficult to predict. You're right. I've heard that this could be the worst recession in our lifetimes. Uh, this could be perhaps a repeat of 1929 or perhaps worse. Uh, one of the reasons being being that the, the debt in our financial system has never been greater, among other reasons. Certainly, you've heard these projections before. How would you respond to well, these remarks? 
I think there are a lot of the people, a lot of comments and considerations about a recession that don't necessarily uh, find support in, in existing data and such. And yes, we have a massive debt problem, uh, not only on a federal level, uh, but on a sovereign level globally and on a personal and a corporate level. There's an enormous amount of debt. But I think that there is a certain fear of that debt on the part of a lot of people. And you will find people who, you know, have been concerned. I've been concerned about the government's debt really since the early 1980s when it crossed a trillion dollars of net debt. But, you know, there's concern and then there's fear. And I think there's a lot of fear about the the, the effect of debt and the limitations that that debt puts on uh, the monetary authorities and the fiscal authorities. Uh, and I think there's also a lot of fear mongering. And I just don't see the support. The debt is a problem. It has been a problem for 40 years. It will continue to be a problem probably for another 40 years as we work it out, if we work it out. But it, uh, it's not as big of a problem as some of the fear mongering and the fearfulness uh, would have us believe. You mentioned there are pockets of strength in our economy that may uh, suggest that the economy will not be as bad as some predictions have suggested. Mm -hmm. What are these pockets of strength, Jeff? Well, one of the things that we've seen recently, and and you know, just to support the view, there were people who were saying we were going to be in a recession in the first quarter or first half of 2021. And we did have negative uh, contraction in the U.S. economy in the first two quarters of, of 2021, but it was very small. Um, and the NBER hasn't declared it if it was an official recession yet. But, you know, if you look for pockets of weakness, you'll see them in the housing market and you'll see them in commercial real estate. Um, but if you look in other fact sectors of the economy, uh, including transportation, uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure construction, fiscal spending, uh, consumer spending, consumer borrowing, business equipment and investments, capital investments by businesses, uh, employment, you'll, you'll see strength across all of those sectors. So there are pockets of weakness, but there are also a lot of pockets of strength right now, which could carry us clearly two or three more quarters forward before you get into the constraints that would be in there. Let me say one other thing about it. A lot of people who focus on the idea of a debt bomb and um, an imminent deep recession focus on monetary policy as the end all and be all. And I'm not a monetarist. Monetary policy and, and monetary trends are clearly important to the economy, but they are, in our analysis, secondary to the actual real economy, supply and growing supply constraints. And we are seeing some real constraints, not, not supply chain constraints, but actual supply constraints. We are seeing some supply constraints, and we'll see some more because of the flooding in the farmland in California. We're seeing some real con supply constraints in the U.S. economy starting to emerge. They're emerging because the demand for those goods and services have been so strong. So you, we look at the real economy, the supply and supply constraints that may be emerging. We look at demand for goods and services, which has been have been very strong both from consumers and from business, but they're starting to cool off a little bit right now and show some signs of wagging. And then we look a lot at fiscal policy because, and, and you know, real economy supply and demand and fiscal policy to us are much more important uh, leading indicators of a possible economic downturn or recession than our monetary policy. And if you look at fiscal policy, yes, there has been some steep contraction from since 2020, but it is still extremely expansive. I uh, I want to comment on another fear since you brought up a lot of yeah. fear mongering. 
Yeah. Um, this is something I've heard for a while. Uh, the dollar is about to collapse. And, you know, every year I hear different reasons as to why it's going to collapse. Now, the DXY has been falling over the last three months, but over a multi-decade time period, it's still very strong. In fact, last year was the strongest it's been in 20 years. I, I, I like it to comment on these dollar collapse fears. Part of it is predicated on this debt that we talked about. Another is hyperinflation. I want to talk about inflation in just a minute. And the other one is the loss of the U.S. dollar, the dollar status as a reserve currency around the world. And there are various reasons as to why that could happen, according to pundits. So I'd like you to address these points, please, and whether or not the DXY will continue softening this year, if not an outright collapse. Yeah, um, boy, that's a, they, that's a whole bunch of questions there. That's a, a college-level lecture. Uh, but uh, let's start with the, the, the fears of the collapse. Uh, we don't see a collapse of the dollar anytime soon. From a very long-term perspective, I mean several decades, we do think that the dollar will lose some status on a global basis. But right now, there's an old saying that a Polish central banker told me in 1981. He said, Mr. Christian, if you owe a bank enough, you own it. And the United States owes the world enough that it controls the currency. And the reality is, uh, you know, that the liquidity of the dollar is so enormous compared to other currencies. You can't really move quickly away from the dollar. Now, let's look at different places where the dollar is used. Monetary reserves held by central banks. Um, about 60% of the foreign exchange reserves held by central banks are in U.S. dollars. And they have been 58 to 64 percent for most of the last 30 years. So the dollar hasn't been being dumped by central banks. You are seeing central banks take their current account surpluses and try to diversify their portfolio. So most of those surpluses, and that's the second point that I'll, I'll, I'll the third point I'll bring, most of those surpluses are in U.S. dollars. So they'll buy euros or yen or other currencies reflecting what their trade what their country's trade uh trade flows are and gold uh but the reality is that the dollar proportion of monetary reserves have been very stable actually risen a little bit over the last couple of years and continue to be high now a subtext there is you'll find a lot of people talk about how the chinese government has all of these treasuries and and us dollars and they're like the fifth largest or third large, third, fourth or fifth largest uh, government holder of U.S. Treasury securities. And the bulk of offshore Treasury securities are not held by any government. They're held by corporations, pension funds and individuals. And there are economists who study this who think that the majority of those offshore dollars are actually held by US corporations, pension funds, and individuals. So those are the real people that you have to worry about dumping the dollar. Yeah, you know, and, and it's not the Chinese central bank. But getting back to your point, monetary reserves, the dollar has not been losing stature. In the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it probably will. Most central banks would like to see a poly uh uh they'd like to see a diversified portfolio. But right now, with 60% in the dollar, 20% in the euro, 10%, 5% in the pound, 5% in the yen, if you try to move away from the dollar too fast, you'd be causing hyperinflation in those other nations because you'd have to expand their money supply so fast to make up for it. The second thing is private wealth, private financial wealth, Estimates are 70 to 80% of that globally is denominated in U.S. dollars. Again, you can't get away from those dollars that fast without driving up the asset value of any other currency or gold or silver that you might be racing into. So you, the transition has to be slow. And the third component is international trade settlements. And the dollar is still used for something like 90% of international trade settlements. So... You know, the dollar, if you own the, owe the world enough, you own it. If the dollar has such a dominant place in international currency systems, it will take many decades more 
to 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 shift away from it. All right. Well, uh, let's take a shorter term perspective then, maybe a multi-month <laughs> instead of a multi-decade perspective. The DXY, like I mentioned, has been softening. Do you think that uh, policy divergence between the Federal Reserve and its peers, perhaps in Europe and the Bank of England, would per- would put further pressure on the DXY later this year? I saw data released yesterday, last night, for example. The uh, UK inflation rate is now at 10.1%. Certainly there's pressure on other central banks to rein in inflation while U.S. inflation has been softening. Yeah, it's interesting because what you're finding uh, with the possible exception of the U.K. is other central banks are actually being more uh, uh, dovish on their interest rate policies than the U.S. right now. I think it's the opposite. I don't see the dollar softening sharp uh, significantly over the next six to nine months relative to these other currencies. If anything, I think that the dollar may regain some of the strength. As you said earlier, the dollar was very strong up until October, November of last year. Uh, It was at very, you know, multi-decade highs, I guess. Uh, And it's come off since November, uh, but it is still relatively high. Our expectation is it finds a base around current levels and moves sideways to higher over the next three quarters, partly because of the divergence between the U.S. economy and other economies where we might do a little bit better than other economies, which would uh, increase demand for US dollars to pay for trade with the US and investment in the US. How much of gold's rise rally to $2,000, which we've seen this year was due to the weakness of the dollar? It was partly due to the weakness of the U.S. dollar. Uh, The most recent increase that we saw was due to the banking crisis in in March. You know, uh, in November and December and January, you saw the gold price rise. A lot of that was the dollar uh, declining during that same period of time. A lot of it also was sort of just sort of bargain hunting. The gold price had gone from $2,060 in March of 2022 down to 1624 uh, on November 3rd, 2022. And at 1624, there were any number of people, including some major central banks that said, hey, the price of gold is 25% lower than it was at the onset of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, And okay, it's not 1,250 or 1,350 the way it was in the middle of 2019, but it's down from $2,000. It's down from $1,800. This is probably a good place to buy. And you saw November and December, pretty strong demand for gold, both from individual investors, you know, private investors and from central banks. And it should be noted that prior to November, as the price of gold was falling, you saw pretty weak demand for gold, especially in China. Let's talk about, I want to come back to central bank buying of gold, but, uh, you know, certainly we've seen a lot of optimism for the gold market after it breached $2,000. Even today, we're hovering around $2,000. We're speaking on Wednesday. Uh, for as long as I can remember, Jeff, your your predictions of gold have been the more accurate ones <laughs> among some of the other analysts I've spoken to. Uh, I, I want to get your outlook on, on the gold market. Uh, many people I've talked to have been projecting new all-time highs for gold. Is that possible? We this expect- year, this year. Yeah, uh, this year, we don't expect it. We do- oh, well, yes, we do. You know, our expectation, look, last year, the annual gold price was $1,804. That was a record high. This year, we think that the record go, the annual average gold price at the end of everything will be around 1, 000, over $1,900. So we're looking for about a 10% increase in the gold price this year on an annual average basis to record levels. They are then... We are then expecting even higher increases in gold prices in 2024, 2025, reflecting the fact that, as you said earlier, we've been saying for some time that we thought that the next big recession would be in 2024, 2025, and it would coincide with financial market instability and crises. In the past, uh, you wrote in your gold report uh, that gold has behaved you know, consistently well during recessions, but there's been a range in performances, right? I think you liken it to NFL players and their salaries. Uh, yes. There's a big range. You know, on average, they do well, but there's a, there is still a big range. I, one thing is clear, though, is that every time we have a big market crash, 
such that the S&P goes down dramatically in a short period of time, gold tends to fall alongside with it as asset correlations converge to one during big crashes. Uh, do you see that happening into this next recession, which you wrote in your gold report could be a, could be a severe one? And if so, wouldn't the stock markets crash bringing down gold with it? Yeah. You know, one of the functions of gold for investors and others is to be a liquidity storage facility. And when you get into a period where your stocks and bond prices are falling sharply, uh, you will find investors and financial institutions and sometimes governments liquidating their gold to raise cash to meet margin requirements and to help stabilize their overall portfolio. That's one of the reasons why they own gold is to have that available, you know, uh, if you look at it. And, and that then tends to drive the gold price down on a short-term basis during a stock market decline. The gold price tends to fall on a shorter term basis and then start rising before the stock market does. So if you look at some of the past periods of financial crises, what you'll see is they'll both fall initially, gold will respond, re rebound within a matter of a few months, and the stock market sometimes will take years to recover back to its prior peak. Now, uh, let's talk about central bank buying, which you mentioned. Last year, 2022, saw the highest on record in terms of central bank buying of gold. Uh, this is according to data from the World Gold Council. Uh, why is it that central banks last year bought so much gold, especially considering that gold, the price of gold was on a decline throughout the year? Uh, because their data is wrong. <laughs> to oh, put it okay. briefly, you know, our estimate is that central banks added about 10 million ounces of gold to their monetary reserves last year. But you have to understand central banks in a number of countries will serve as a market maker or a conduit for gold and sometimes silver trades. You'll see this in Brazil, in certain Middle Eastern countries, in other Latin American countries, in the Philippines, and in China. And one of the things that we saw, if you just look at China, so central banks will have their monetary reserves of gold, and then they'll have a side bucket, which is a trading inventories where they're buying and selling for clients, if you will. And those clients may be other government agencies, or they may be private base metals smelters that have byproduct gold coming out of their, their smelting and refining process, and the central bank will sell it for them. Or it may be excess material from the jewelry industry, and then they'll sell it to people. Now, within China, the People's Bank of China says, uh, the government says to the People's Bank of China, when you're buying and selling gold and silver for third parties within the Chinese economy, uh, you can sell the silver wherever you want. We don't mind if you sell it to offshore entities and export it. But the gold should stay within China. It's just government policy. So what happened last year was in the first quarter of last year, and if, if you go back to the first quarter of last year, we had fears of a recession, fears of inflation, fears of rising interest rates, and then the Russians invaded Ukraine, and the oil price shot up. And gold went from, I don't remember where it was at the beginning of the year, it was about 1800 I believe, and it went up to $2,060 by early March, and then it came back off. And in that period of rising gold prices in the first quarter, you saw tremendous demand for gold around the world, including in China. In the second and third quarters into the fourth quarter of last year, you then had an enormous decline, like an 80% decline in demand for gold in some sectors of the Chinese economy. And you had a lot of gold that people wanted to sell, refiners, Jewelers who had bought inventories because demand was strong in the first quarter, and then the demand for gold jewelry just disappeared in for, for seven months, eight months. Uh, there was a lot of gold that people wanted to sell that they couldn't find buyers for. And about 20 million ounces, no, about 10 million ounces of that 
built up in that side pocket at the People's Bank of China. And the People's Bank of China said, okay, we're looking for buyers for this gold in um, China. Now, People's Bank of China's monetary policy, they stopped buying in the first half of 2019 when the price of gold was 12, 1,250, 1,350. When the price of gold started rising in the second half of 2019, the People's Bank of China, which is a very good value investor, said, we're not going to pay $1,500 or $1,800 or $2,000 for gold. So they stopped buying gold from uh, for their monetary reserves. There's a misnomer in the gold market where people say the People's Bank of China stopped reporting their gold holdings in the middle of 2019. They didn't. They reported them every month. And every month from the middle of 2019 until November of 2022, they said, we didn't buy any gold. Our gold holdings are unchanged. They're not. It's not that they weren't reporting. They were reporting that they were not buying. Now, 2022 comes along. The price goes from $2,060 to 1624 And they say, you know, it's not 1200 or 1350 but it's down 25% from the peak earlier this year. And we're sitting on 10 million ounces of gold that people have asked us to find buyers for within China. Maybe we'll take a million ounces. Maybe we'll take another million ounces in December and another 1.5 million ounces in January and February. And at the same time, the gold price started rising. Once the gold price starts rising, private demand for that gold starts rising too. So you started seeing a rejuvenation of demand for gold in the private sector, jewelry and investment products within China. That 10 million ounces was never central bank gold buying. It was an inventory that was set up in a side bucket uh, to be, you know, to be taken in and sold for others. So if you didn't understand that, you'd say that central bank gold buying was not 10 million ounces, but 20 million ounces, the highest level on record since the 1960s, early 60s, you know, or 50s. So it, central banks bought a lot of gold. They bought 10 million ounces of gold. That's a lot of gold. They didn't buy record levels. Uh, so the justification for saying that they bought record levels, I can't do. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. I, I understand. I I, I asked this it, I asked this next question in jest, uh, Jeff, but uh, do you think central banks are the best hedge funds in the world? <laughs> no. Central banks, hedge funds have a three to five year time horizon for an investment. And central banks have the luxury of saying, I don't have a time horizon. So if you look at, if you look at, a, a, you know, in many countries, the sovereign wealth fund is owned and or managed or supervised by the central bank. And the Sovereign Wealth Fund is a hedge fund. It has a three to five year time horizon. Uh, and so they got to get it right on the timing. But a central bank can say, I don't have a time horizon, so I can buy this stuff. I'm not looking for capital appreciation. I'm looking for capital preservation. So I can buy this stuff and I'll never be in a position where I'll say, gee, that was stupid to buy that. And finally, let's talk a little bit about the CPM group. Tell us what the nature of your work is, your purpose, and uh, what we can look forward to in terms of releases, uh, data, uh, your books, webinars, and, uh, and, and so forth. CPM group is a research and consulting company. We grew out of J. Aaron and Company and Goldman Sachs, which had a research department. Because the gold and silver markets and platinum markets and other commodity markets are so secretive, J. Aaron in the late 60s, early 70s started developing the capacity to get a good measure of, you know, everybody can do mine production because it's regulatorily, uh, you know, mining companies or public companies, they have to report and they have a financial incentive to report because they want investors to invest in them. But scrap refiners and fabricators and investors have no regulatory obligation to report what they're doing in gold, silver, platinum, and other commodities, and they have a financial disincentive. J. Aaron and CPM Group, as the outgrowth of its research department, we spun off in 1986. We have developed a network of people who, A, rely on us for research, consulting, price projections, and analyses of the markets, 
and B, in relying on us, give us information that you don't get if you're a desk analyst. So we have a superior flow of information. We have a superior flow of analysis. We have an excellent track record going back to 1980 in calling gold and silver and copper and platinum and palladium prices based on our supply demand price analyses. You know, so it's not like we don't have a black box. Well, there's some conspiratorial operation that did this or that to the market. And the idea that our price projections have been as accurate as they have been over the last 38 years, 40 years, 43 years, really, uh, sort of supports the idea that our supply demand analysis is right. Because if we're basing our price projections on our supply demand analysis and our supply demand analysis is wrong, our prices will be wrong. But since our price has been right, that kind of supports the supposition that we've been getting it right on the supply demand. So we do a lot of basic research and we advise mostly investors, institutional investors, family offices, high net worth individuals, companies that supply information and analysis and, and, and uh, view market views to retail and wholesale and institutional investors. Most of our business is on the investment side. People pay us to be accurate and right, not to be bullish, not to be bearish, not to promote gold, not to uh, discourage uh, investing in gold. So we ha we supply our research and analysis to investors, mining companies, processors, refiners, and smelters, industrial users, investors, companies that support investment, central banks, governments, uh, anybody with a large price exposure to commodities. In addition to precious metals, we do high purity manganese, which is used in lithium ion batteries, molybdenum, tantalum, niobium, and other specialty metals, and uranium. And again, because we're an independent company, we're not sitting there talking our book. We have no book. We're, you know, People pay us to get our analysis and our price projections right. But you're not influenced by miners or their activities or central banks and financial institutions in any way? We have a mixed clientele. So at any given time, there are some people who wish we were more bullish and there are some people who wish we were more bearish. We created a big report for silver in the late 80s, early 90s for a group of silver mining companies that wanted uh, to promote good information to silver investors or would-be investors. This was at a time when investors were turning into net sellers of silver. Um, we did that for five years under an initial contract, but then that contract, when that five years were up, we said, no, we're not going to do this because you keep trying to make us be more bullish on silver than we are. And because it's kind of hurting our reputation. I mean, there were people at the time who were saying that we were part of a, a New York Jewish conspiracy to drive the price of silver up. I, I I thought the conspiracy was that you're driving the price of silver down. I, I didn't realize it was up. But In the 1990s, within the span of probably 48 hours, I was accused of being part of a conspiracy to drive the silver price up and another conspiracy to drive the price of silver down. Like I said, we spread our, we spread our clientele across the market. <laughs> <laughs> so which is it? <laughs> you're driving it up Neither. or down? There's no conspiracy. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your insights, and uh, we'll put a link in the description to the CPM group and um, and uh, and your work. Thank you, Jeff. I uh, I appreciate it, and uh, we'll speak again soon. All right. It's good to be on, and thank you. And again, congratulations. I look forward to a, a long era of the David Lynn Report. I appreciate it. Hopefully, that's the case. And longer uh, thank than you, you want. <laughs> 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 well, on that note, thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.